and welcome to this review of my Optimus Maximus keyboard. This keyboard is most notable for having a tiny programmable 16-bit color OLED screen in every single key. So over 100 little screens on a keyboard, which is <laughs> unique to say the least, and surely puts even RGB backlighting to shame in terms of ostentatiousness. This keyboard was designed in 2007 by studio Artemy Lebedev, a Moscow-based design studio founded in 1995, specializing in industrial, graphic, web and interface design, and their main principle, in two words, is apparently no bullshit. Right. They're actually not the first ones to come up with an idea like this. This article from as early as 1979 mentions the IEE Proto Switch, a keyboard switch that can project one or a multiple of a bunch of legends onto a keycap, although it's obviously nowhere near as extensively programmable as this one. Anyway, as you would expect of such a high-tech piece of equipment, especially because it's also fully programmable, the keyboard retailed at a rather steep price, $1,600. And <laughs> it sucks ass. I actually got this as a donation. Yes, you heard me right. Someone donated me a $1,600 golden turd, a dung heap deluxe, a sumptuous sample of stool, a magnificent mound of manure. That's how desperate they were to get rid of it. <laughs> Thanks, mate. So let's look at the screen thingies first, because that's obviously the coolest aspect of the board, and we'll get to the swearing later on. Every key has a screen in it, which is stationary, and the transparent keycap, so to speak, moves around it. Each key uses the same size of screen, even the spacebar, and this can actually make recognizing the larger keys kind of difficult in the dark if you display some nonsense on it. The screens can be customized using a configurator tool. It allows you to display a letter, symbol, any text or picture on it. There's a video mode as well, but that's in beta stage and I don't know how it works. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to get GIFs working on it either, or GIFs, whichever you prefer, which would have been especially cool, but maybe there's a way I don't know. The manual is not very helpful, to put it mildly. The software is far from great, but it's not the worst I've seen. It's not exactly a hand holder, if you get what I mean, but it's not ultra cryptic either, and it updates in real time, so it's easy-ish to figure out how it works if you just press a load of buttons and see what happens. Also, now that we're on the subject, considering this tool is only 7 megabytes in size, and is able to program over 100 little screens, why the fuck do Corsairs and Razer's software packages need to be hundreds of megabytes just to do some RGB backlighting? It does get detected and blocked by Ubisoft's BattleEye anti-cheat software though, so if I get banned from Rainbow Six Siege, I <laughs> might have to shoot them an angry email. There's some special functions as well. You can have keys display a real-time clock and calendar, or CPU, memory, and network loads, which is actually extremely cool and even useful, genuinely. You can even use this paint function to paint on this template, and then it will display that on the keyboard when you save it. This function is also how you make the whole board display a certain picture. You just copy-paste something on top of this template and it displays it, although the space between the screens is bigger in real life than it assumes them to be in this template, so it'll end up looking a bit fractured. Unfortunately, if you look very carefully, when you display relatively plain pictures, such as this blue sky, you can see that this keyboard has been used in an Azerty layout for a while, as the screens are weaker where it displayed the previous layout. I guess the organic substrate is partly worn out in these areas. Also, the use of a large amount of the pixels, i.e. anything complex overlaying the keyboard, such as this IBM poster, makes the keyboard generate a high-pitched tone that gets louder the more of the pixels are engaged, and it's very annoying, so much so that you can't really use this keyboard like this without using headphones. I mean, what the fuck? According to the specs sheet, the OLED should have a lifetime of about 20,000 hours, or 7 years, and then they'll start to darken gradually, eventually needing replacement. It's kind of a bummer, but not the end of the world. Yet, at $1,600 to buy, that's a $230 write-off per year, almost $20 a month. That level of degradation is roughly equivalent to bricking three Unicomp Model M's every year. <laughs> Impressive. 
You can program different layers of pictures or symbols into it, and you can have, for example, a shifted symbol set, a control set, an old graphic set, or a combination, or whatever. It takes a while for it to switch between the different sets, but it's a cool feature. You can program any layout, macro, or a whole bunch of functions into the keyboard as well, and it saves the layout and picture stuff on an SD card in this slot here, which is a first for a keyboard, possibly. As you can see, it's also got two USB ports. The build quality seems very good, and it's really heavy even at 1.8 kilos, heavier than the vast majority of premium keyboards on the market right now. The keyboard uses a fairly standard ANSI keyboard layout with 10 extra keys to the left, plus a big one on top, almost exactly like the Sun Type 5C. This block to the left is useful for putting in special functions or macros or whatever, or even just to display the CPU stats I mentioned before. It's at this point you'll also realize that the keyboard is rather large. I mean, with a name like Optimus Maximus, you're probably not really expecting a 20%, I guess. But it's way bigger than a Model M, and almost as wide as a battleship at 54 centimeters. Or roughly one and a half, size 46 feet, if you're more comfortable with the Imperial system. And this puts it firmly in the battlecruiser category. The extreme width of the keyboard is in part due to the keys, which are about 10% bigger than normal keys. It's quite uncomfortable to use, actually, because you have to spread out your fingers a lot more, which puts a lot of strain on your hands, especially when you're playing video games, when it goes almost into cramping mode. For the longest time, I had no idea what switches were in this keyboard, as there was no documentation on it, Studio Lebedev refused to get back to me, and I had no idea how to remove the switch units. All I knew was that they're extremely scratchy and unpleasant, they bind pretty badly, and they felt too stiff to boot in my opinion. The spacebar in particular is so scratchy and mushy and awful in every way that it fails to trigger half the time. I mean, this is some serious 50 caliber fuck time right here, guys. The feel was so bad that coupled with the fact I had no idea what switches they were, I didn't know whether they were supposed to be linear or tactile. But for once I'm honestly being dead serious, I genuinely didn't know if these were supposed to be linear or tactile. Some of the switches have some kind of highly scratchy event in there that vaguely resembles a mild tactile bump, while others are genuinely 100% linear. I honestly, to the best of my abilities, had no idea what these were supposed to feel like. When I finally managed to pull off one of the units, it quickly became clear why these felt so bad. Yep, they're Cherry ML. That would explain it. These little fuckers only barely escaped being on my top 10 list of worst switches ever made. They won it over Alps Integrated Dome and the Triads, but make no mistake, I fucking hate these. And the fact that the giant caps have to slide around these screens makes it so much worse. Dimming the key feel and adding a huge amount of binding as well, which is why they feel so stiff. The keycaps are also completely smooth, which feels kind of strange and icky and clammy and, on the whole, unnatural. I mean, I understand that they need to be very clear, or you can't see the screens below very well. And ABS caps that have become a bit shiny is one thing, but <laughs> fuck me with a totem pole, this is just bleh. You'll also have noticed that I've been filming almost everything with only sideways lighting to avoid glare off of the keycap surface like this. Between the awkwardly large key size and hideous switches, the overall typing experience on this board is extremely terrible, and moreover, my friends had to suffer me playing like a fucking donkey dipstick for a week on this thing. It's not very well suited to gaming at all. Which is a shame, I mean, look at it, it's practically made to display weapon icons and other gaming shit on it. Anyway, I guess the idea is really cool, and I'm sure it has some use in some way, but as soon as anything involves actually touching the keys, I'd say it's not worth it. The switches are fishy fuck nuggets with a capital F, and actually using the keyboard is akin to autoflagellation. Jesus Christ doing the Macarena, what a calamitous catastrophe! The teaser trailer was a ridiculous amount of fun to make, though. <laughs> I've got to give it that. You can also field replace individual units if they go bad or start to show after images, even though that's probably quite an expensive affair. 
but apart from being an admittedly very cool eye-catcher, I can't see how this keyboard is worth the car-sized hole it'll burn in your pocket. If they hadn't made the key so big and used switches that weren't made from Satan's compressed excrement, it would have been only prohibitively expensive, but might otherwise have been a nice keyboard. Shame. Such a shame. Anyway, that's it for this review. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard. Next week there won't be a review due to the holidays, but I'll see you guys again in the first week of January. Take care and happy holidays.